So if the Holy Grail wasn't holy and the round table was a fake, what else have we got to go on? What can lead us back to the historical kernel uh, that lies at the, the heart and at the beginning of all of these other uh, iterations of the Arthur narrative? If the literary trail only leads us back to Geoffrey of Monmouth and Keelhook and Olwen in that time period, or to Chrétien de Troyes, then how do we go beyond that? Well, when our literary trail runs out, we have disciplines like history and archeology span that we can use to sort of triangulate our uh, search. Uh, if any one of those disciplines can't uh, answer our questions, maybe the three of them together can. So let's start with Camelot. Surely, if there was some magnificent palace uh, 1,500 years ago on the island of Britain, there's something left, some archeological remains uh, that we can find today. The name Camelot first appears, once again, in Chrétien de Troyes uh, in his Lancelot, or the Knight of the Cart. Uh, keep in mind, this is the first time we have Lancelot named, uh, the first time he's a character, uh, the first time, obviously, that he's uh, described as having an affair with Guinevere. Uh, Chrétien de Troyes also gave us the first reference of the Grail, uh, and our first sort of uh, representation of Percival as a Grail Knight. Uh, there are a lot of firsts in uh, Chrétien de Troyes, and once again, Chrétien de Troyes is the first one to give us the reference to Camelot. As it turns out, there was a uh, Roman fortification, uh, a nice sort of stone-built castle, not quite what we see in representations of later Middle Ages, but something, well, much more advanced than your average uh, Celtic fortification. And it was called Camulodunum, and that's pretty close. It was a militaristic fortification, uh, the first two syllables and possibly the third sound very similar. Uh, it sounds like we have a candidate for Camelot. There's just one problem with this, and that is that this area of the east coast of Britain, uh, at the time that the Battle of Mount Baden was fought, was already well garrisoned by the Saxons. Uh, this was solid Saxon territory. There was virtually no way there could be like a little island of uh, Britons in, a, in an ocean of, of Anglo-Saxons. Uh, another city that is frequently associated with King Arthur is the uh, southern British city of Winchester. Uh, Thomas Mallory identifies Winchester twice in Le Morte d'Arthur as the location of Camelot. Uh, this is where the Winchester Round Table was uh, preserved, although unfortunately it doesn't date back beyond the 13th century. Uh, but is Winchester a potential candidate? It was uh, a Roman fortification, and uh, it would have made a good capital, except, once again, this is part of Anglo-Saxon England at the time when uh, Arthur would have fought if he fought at the Battle of Mount Baden. But there's another location for Arthur's court that's mentioned frequently before Chrétien, and even sometimes after Chrétien, and even in Chrétien's Lancelot. Right before he mentions Camelot, he says that Arthur departed his court at Carleon in order to ride to Camelot to hold court there. This introduces us to two concepts, one of which is that uh, Arthur's court was mobile. Uh, some early versions of the round table have it being described as uh, portable. You can break it down and, and take it to the next place. That's because um, a high king at this time would have to go from location to location in order to make sure that all the various regions of his realm uh, were remaining loyal, were uh, seeing him face to face, and that he could uh, see what was going on. Uh, all for the same uh, basic thinking that goes into the round table, you don't want anyone to feel uh, superior by their proximity to the king at the table. You also don't want them to feel superior or inferior based on proximity to the king uh, geographically. So uh, Arthur is frequently described as uh, having a, a roaming court, uh, but most often the place that uh, court is held is at Carleon in southern Wales. Uh, Carleon is a real place, and it was a Roman fortification, and uh, it very likely could have been settled by the Britons. Uh, remember that the word Welsh means foreigner precisely because this was an area that the Anglo-Saxons who gave the Welsh that name uh, could not penetrate. They, they couldn't push that far in. However, there's an even more intriguing location that is not a Roman fortification, but is a very, very old Iron Age hill fort. And even though it's not much more than a hill now, it's referred to as Cadbury Castle in the South Cadbury region of southern England. And what makes this uh, location stand out, and it was noticed 
uh, at least back in 1723 when this uh, drawing uh, here above me was drawn. It was identified even then as Camelot. As you can see in the drawing, there are these uh, terraces that uh, some of which allow for a road to go from the lower uh, ground area up to the top, but some of them are there seemingly just to be ramparts, to be areas that uh, attackers would have to climb and be at an extreme uh, downhill disadvantage. And even though this particular site was settled and abandoned and settled and abandoned over and over again over centuries and centuries, uh, it was abandoned during the Roman period, but it was resettled right after the Romans left Britain. That indicates that this was a place that was chosen as a, a garrison, as a, a sort of uh, outpost against the Saxons. And located as it is, riding distance to Carleon, so Chrétien tells us that uh, Arthur left his court at Carleon to go to Camelot, uh, and it's also close to other sites that are associated with King Arthur. Uh, his re reputed birthplace was at Tintagel in Cornwall. Uh, the town of Glastonbury uh, has very strong associations with the island of Avalon, which I'll talk about in another lecture. And Stonehenge, which uh, is a pre-Celtic site. It was there uh, before the Celts even came from continental Europe to the island of Britain. But it shows up uh, in Arthurian literature, at least as a landmark. Unfortunately, what we have with South Cadbury is a likely location that we can match with a narrative, but so far all of our narratives are being written down 500 years after it was once again abandoned. So what does this tell us about what Camelot would have looked like? Well, once again, if we're looking at the history, then it would have been a, a, a terraced hill with uh, earthwork ramparts. Uh, with uh, wooden posts and wooden fences uh, built up around it that would look something like uh, uh, an American pioneer outpost, military uh, outpost in the 1800s or even sooner, made of wood, not of stone. The Roman fortifications would have been made out of stone, but they would have been occupied by the Saxons. So it would have looked much more primitive than we're uh, accustomed to seeing in illustrations and in movies. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't imagine that when we're reading Chrétien de Troyes, because Chrétien de Troyes clearly imagined something much grander uh, than what would have been around 500 years before him. Uh, the medieval manuscripts that depict uh, Camelot as a castle uh, always depict it as one of the more uh, opulent uh, castles of their own time, whether that's the 13th or 14th century. Uh, it's anachronistic, but it, within the narrative, that's what the author is clearly portraying. Unfortunately, that just doesn't connect with the archeology. span And that leads us to Arthur himself. This person who is said in Geoffrey of Monmouth and in later accounts to have been so powerful that not only did he unite all of Britain uh, under his rule, but when threatened with subordination by the Roman Empire, he rode out with his knights uh, across Europe, conquering all of these other lands, and even forced Rome to uh, yield to him so that it became his fiefdom, uh, his sort of vassal state. So if you ever read Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, you get a very interesting uh, portrayal of uh, King Arthur, but it'll be without a lot of the elements that we typically assume are uh, integral, uh, absolutely necessary to an Arthurian story. Uh, he is the King of Britain. He does have a sword called Excalibur or Caliburnus. Uh, however, he doesn't pull the sword from a stone and he doesn't get it from a lake. Uh, Merlin is a very prominent figure, uh, but there is no round table. Uh, Guinevere is mentioned, but she's not having an affair with uh, Lancelot. She uh, seems to have an affair and betray Arthur for Mordred. Uh, Arthur does have some of the best knights in the world, uh, Sir Gawain, Bedivere, Ivan, uh, Kay, but uh, Lancelot has not appeared yet. Uh, Percival has not appeared yet, unless uh, he's the king named Peridur, who shows up in Welsh literature. Uh, there's no Sir Galahad. Uh, there, there are stories about Sir Tristan, but he's not Sir Tristan, he's just Tristan. Uh, he serves King Mark, not King Arthur. Those narrative traditions haven't merged to, to make him one of Arthur's uh, knights yet. There's no quest for the Holy Grail. There's no Lancelot to have an affair with Guinevere. Uh, a lot of Geoffrey's uh, narrative focuses on Arthur's conquest of Rome. Uh, and upon returning to Britain after this conquest of Rome, he is betrayed by uh, Mordred, uh, who is his illegitimate nephew, not his son, like in later accounts. And after this battle, after Arthur is 
what seems to be fatally wounded, uh, but he's still uh, alive at the end and he's taken to the island of Avalon to be healed by Morgan Le Fay. And Morgan Le Fay is described in Geoffrey of Monmouth's account, uh, especially in uh, the Vita Merlini, but she is not an enemy of Arthur and she is not apparently his sister or half-sister. Uh, she is someone who lives in the island of Avalon uh, and is uh, quasi-supernatural and able to, to heal this uh, otherwise mortal wound that Arthur has. So not what we might consider a complete Arthur narrative, but many of the basics are there. But what about when we go back before Geoffrey? Almost 200 years before Geoffrey, we have the Welsh Annals, or the Annals Cambriae. Annals are basically just uh, lists of what happened in a particular year and then move on to the next year and the next year. And uh, I've got the uh, estimated uh, years listed on the right, but the original text is on the left and you'll notice there's no numbers there. And that's because they just say, in this year, this happened, and most of those years are blank. But in the listing for 516, there is described the Battle of Baden. And it's the Battle of Baden in which Arthur carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for three days and three nights on his shoulders, and the Britons were the victors. Uh, keep in mind the invading Anglo-Saxons at the time were uh, non-Christian. They hadn't been converted to Christianity yet. They were pagans. And the Britons had been converted for the most part. So they were Christian. The invaders were not. So this became a very sort of religious, uh, for lack of a better word, crusade not one of the, the great crusades uh, to the Holy Land, but a conflict that could have just been cultural uh, takes on a religious element. But we don't get much more description than that. Uh, Arthur shows up again in 537 and we're told at the Battle of Camlan in which Arthur and Medrot fell. Well, Medrot is the uh, Latinized version of Mordred. Uh, the thing is, you'll notice that it doesn't say Arthur fell fighting Mordred or uh, Arthur and Medrut fought each other at the Battle of Camlan. Uh, grammatically, it is possible that we're being told that they fell side by side in the same battle. Uh, we're just not given enough information. You'll notice several entries below that of a, a person named Gildas. So I'll come back to him in a, in a little bit, but I point it out because uh, this shows that, he, that Gildas was a near contemporary to the Battle of Camlan and the Battle of Baden. And in 573, you'll see uh, a listing that I made reference to in the last lecture about Merlin. At the Battle of Aphrodirith, between the sons of Elifer and Gwyntholo, uh, son of Kidio, in which the battle Gwyntholo fell, Merlin went mad. Now, this does not appear in the earliest uh, copies of the Welsh Annals. Uh, it does appear in later ones, and it might be an, an interpolation, uh, an addition made after the fact, after someone is looking at these references to Arthur and deciding, well, some reference to Merlin should be there. The thing is, uh, they use Merlin, not Myrthen. Remember that it's Geoffrey of Monmouth who changes uh, Myrthen, the, the name associated with uh, the, the bard who had the gift of prophecy, uh, and he changes it because in the Latin that makes it sound like uh, the word for shit. So uh, he changes it to make it more eloquent, uh, but this uh, copy of the Welsh Annals uh, has already changed it as well. So this might be something that was added at a later date. It's tempting to see uh, Merlin and Arthur referred to in this earlier text, but we can't be exactly sure that this was the way it was in the original. Before that, another 150 years, around the year 800, we have a reference to Arthur from the Historia Britonum, that is, History of the Britons. Sometimes you will hear this referred to as if it was authored by a man named Ninius. Uh, there was a, a scribe named Ninius at the time, but it turns out that this was actually misattributed. It probably wasn't Ninius that wrote it. But we have a description of Arthur fighting battles against the Saxons. Uh, this time, he's not just fighting one battle, but he's fighting 12 different battles. And this is the earliest reference to Arthur by name that says what he did, that he fought. Uh, there are going to be earlier references to the Battle of Baden, but this is the only one that references Arthur as fighting at the Battle of Baden. And you'll notice here that he's described as a commander. Though there were many more noble than himself, okay, this means that there are many more uh, aristocratically higher, uh, higher in society, uh, more noble than him. So he's not a king and he's not the heir to a throne. Uh, he is someone who is chosen 
uh, 12 times to be a commander. And the Latin word here is Dux Bellarum, D-U-X. You can see it barely uh, where the yellow arrow is at the top of the screen. Uh, D-U-X is where the English word Duke comes from. So it's not a king, uh, but it is uh, a military title. And it comes from the Roman uh, ranking of a, a, a battlefield military leader. And it's 12 battles here, and they seem to be kind of uh, per perhaps a little bit exaggerated, uh, especially if we look at the, the Battle of Baden. The 12th battle uh, was a most severe contest when Arthur penetrated to the hill of Baden. In this engagement, 940 fell by his hand alone, no one but the Lord affording him uh, assistance. Uh, so maybe that means that only his troops uh, following him rather than following one of the other sort of low-level kings uh, or other commanders on the battlefield. Uh, but I don't know, it it's kind of sounds like they're saying that uh, uh, he killed 940 by himself. Uh, we also have uh, his or Christian context uh, referenced here. Uh, when we're told that in the eighth battle uh, near the Gurnian castle where Arthur bore the image of the Holy Virgin, Mother of God, upon his shoulders, uh, that uh, if you remember the uh, earlier image where Arthur is standing on top of the crowns of all of these fallen kingdoms, he has a shield and there's the Virgin Mary holding Jesus uh, on the shield. Uh, this kind of uh, depiction doesn't make it into later literature. Uh, typically, he's got uh, a coat of arms that's pretty closely resembling the family coat of arms of whoever happens to be king of the country where the uh, narrative is, is produced. But we at least have a name Arthur associated with particular battles at a particular point in history. If the Historia Bretonum is the first reference to Arthur's name in relation to what he's doing, uh, the first reference to his name at all is in this Welsh poem, the Igadothan. Uh, the, the double D's there are pronounced as a TH sound, Gdothin. And this was dated to, uh, this poem dates to around the year 600, although the only uh, edition of it we have is from the Book of Aniran, uh, which Aniran is a famous uh, poet, uh, Welsh poet. And in this poem, it's commemorating the fall of the Gdothin, uh, a northern British tribe against uh, another tribe, uh, they fell in battle and they have a leader named Gwarthir. Uh, that's G-W-A-R-D-D-U-R. Uh, sounds kind of like Arthur, but it's not Arthur. In fact, we're told specifically in the poem that he is not Arthur. Uh, so the only reference to Arthur here presumes that you know who Arthur is, that Gwarthir is a great warrior, but he's not Arthur. It doesn't say why he's not Arthur. It doesn't say how they, they're different. Uh, it doesn't say anything about Arthur himself. It just says that over 300 of the best men were slain. Gwarthir pierced them in the center and on either side. He stood out among the noble host. In winters, he gave out horses from his herds. So he's uh, giving out the way war leaders in the Old Norse and Old English uh, poetry are described as a good leader is one who doles out wealth. Uh, if you remember in the Pentecostal Oath, Arthur is promising that he's gonna give his knights uh, lands and titles and wealth as long as they follow the uh, code of chivalry. Uh, but Gwarthir here is uh, at least uh, keeping his men loyal by uh, being generous. Uh, he gave out horses from his herds. Gwarthir summoned the black crows down before the fortress walls. In other words, he's killing a lot of bodies, so the crows are all flocking in so that they can you know, eat the uh, flesh from the body to the dead. These are why crows are usually uh, referenced. Uh, but despite that, despite of how many bodies he left on the battlefield, he was no Arthur. That's it, we've gotta figure out what that means. Does that mean there was an Arthur who left more bodies on the battlefield? Uh, and if so, is that all he's known for? And is this a reference to the Battle of Baden? Uh, we kind of have to put this together ourselves. But it's enticing because it is within a century of possible dates for the Battle of Mount Baden. But that's it for Arthur's name. Now, there is more about the Battle of Baden. Remember, I mentioned the monk named Gildas. Uh, who was mentioned in the Welsh Annals. Uh, Gildas wrote a work called De Exidio et Conquista uh, Britanniae, or the, On the Downfall and Conquest of Britain. And he names a historical figure that we know of named uh, Ambrosius Aurelius. Uh, this is possibly, this is at least the same name as the, the boy who predicts that there's two dragons fighting underground in uh, the uh, earlier account uh, 
uh, that uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth is later gonna change from uh, Ambrosius to Merlin. It seems that uh, Geoffrey sort of conflates Ambrosius and Merlin. But Ambrosius shows up in other Arthurian texts as well as either the uncle or the grandfather of uh, King Arthur uh, through uh, uh, Uther Pendragon, usually as the brother of Uther, uh, Arthur's father. But Gildas tells us only this about Ambrosius and about Baden. Under Ambrosius Aurelius, our people revived their strength and provoked the victors to battle. By the will of the Lord, triumph was theirs. In those days, the citizens of Britain sometimes emerged victorious and sometimes their enemies won the day. In this way, the Lord tested that people, as is his want, as is his way, uh, as if it was uh, present-day Israel. Now, this is very important. Gildas is writing what's called a Jeremiad. It's after the prophet Jeremiah, who says the same thing about Israel. After Israel is overrun, uh, conquered from without, uh, he, he looks for an explanation and says, you know, why would God let his people be defeated? Well, it must be as punishment. We must not be living uh, the way he wants us to. And so he is sending these foreigners to, to punish us. So Gildas is saying the same thing about the Britons. This is why they're being beaten by the Anglo-Saxons, according to him. Um, this state of affairs continued until the year of the siege of Mount Baden, which was the latest, though not the least, of the defeats of those churls, those you know, simple-minded Anglo-Saxons. Uh, that battle took place during the year of my birth, and I reckon that to be 44 years and one month ago. Okay, so a reference to Mount Baden, one person named, that's uh, Ambrosius Aurelius, but no reference to Arthur here. Does that mean that there was no Arthur, that he didn't know who Arthur was? Uh, that's not necessarily the case. What he's writing here is a Jeremiah. It is a, uh, a lament for the religious state of affairs. He's ridiculing uh, the, the aristocracy at the time for uh, being sinful or something. It's uh, they're leading Britain in the wrong direction. Britain's being punished. That's Gildas's point. He's not really interested in you know who killed who. Uh, he's not going through and listing all the battles and listing all the names of the people involved with that. Uh, so it's uh, helping to confirm certain things like Ambrosius Aurelius and uh, Mount Baden, uh, unfortunately not confirming Arthur. Somebody who, if Arthur was uh, fighting at the Battle of Mount Baden, uh, Gildas would have been a contemporary, he would have been alive at the same time, uh, but he, he doesn't leave us with anything. So where does this leave us? Uh, we have uh, I've got two lists here. We've got uh, Arthur-type figures, people who are not named Arthur, but are connected to Arthurian literature or whose actions uh, show up uh, pretty conspicuously uh, attributed to King Arthur. And we have people who are named Arthur and who were uh, at least battlefield leaders, some of them like low-level kings in these uh, small chiefdoms uh, scattered throughout the uh, Celtic Britain. But we don't have the two sort of uh, meeting up. Uh, first of all, I've already mentioned Ambrosius Aurelianus, or Ambrosius Aurelius, or Geoffrey calls him Aurelius Ambrosius. Uh, this is a historical figure. Uh, he was a Roman. He was someone who seems to have been a descendant of uh, a Roman family who had lived in Britain and remained there after the rest of the Romans uh, departed. He's described as having worn the purple. Uh, well, that means he's from you know high-ranking uh, Roman aristocracy. Uh, the family name Ambrosius connects him to uh, the uh, uh, other aristocrat who later became uh, a Christian saint, that's Saint Ambrose, uh, although the two aren't closely connected. He's remembered in Welsh as Imris Wledig. The, the term Wledig is just a, a king or a high king. Uh, Imris is the Welsh pronunciation of Ambrosius. Uh, and Ambrosius did lead coalitions of Britons against invading Irish, invading Picts. Remember that the, the Picts were coming from down from Scotland. Now that the Romans were gone, they were coming over Hadrian's Wall. And of course, the Anglo-Saxons were coming uh, from the east. And Ambrosius Aurelianus was one of those in the early 400s who was uniting these uh, scattered chiefdoms of uh, Celtic tribes who were no longer uh, connected by uh, Roman political structure. Uh, he was rallying them to form a unified resistance. Now, before him, during the time when uh, Britain was Roman, there was uh, a guy named Magnus Maximus. And he is remembered in other Welsh texts as Maxim Wledig. Uh, he was an actual Roman commander of Britain. And when Rome was being uh, threatened initially during the first invasions of Visigoths and others, and also suffering a lot of sort of split between the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire, 
uh, Magnus Maximus uh, took over Britain, uh, he got his legions to be loyal to him and they uh, went into Gaul, uh, modern day France. And so all of the Celtic areas of the Roman Empire are now supporting this guy who uh, seems to be making a bid for uh, the emperorship. And he was very successful for a long time. He invaded Italy in 387 and he was eventually uh, defeated and executed by the Emperor Theodosius. But the fact that he rallied troops from Britain and actually invaded uh, the Roman Empire uh, in order to uh, make Rome subject to him connects him with one of the earliest stories about King Arthur with uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, which was that uh, he actually uh, led his Knights of the Round Table to invade Rome. Of course, in Geoffrey's version, he's successful uh, and Rome becomes subject to King Arthur. Now, both of these historical figures are mentioned in Arthurian tradition, so that would seem to indicate that uh, neither of them could have been a model for Arthur if they're also remembered alongside. They, they have to be distinguished. Uh, however, we remember how doublets work. We've seen a lot of literature already where what appears to be the same story is told twice within the, the larger narrative. Uh, so the example of the, the sea nymphs in the Odyssey. Uh, Circe uh, has her own island and she's an enchantress and she uh, tries to trap Odysseus and his men there and uh, the gods have to intervene to help Odysseus uh, trick her and, and get away. Uh, but then Odysseus ends up on the island of Calypso another uh, supernatural enchantress who tries to keep uh, him there with her. Uh, so these seem to have been maybe the same story at one point, but they were retold by uh, different oral storytellers over a long period of time until they uh, grew apart. Then someone heard both of them and wanted to put them both into the Odyssey, and rather than pick one or the other, uh, just put both. Uh, we've seen this happen in a lot of texts. Very likely that could have happened with both Ambrosius Aurelianus and Magnus Maximus, where they're added into the Arthurian story, but also their stories are sort of attached to Arthur, or in the case of Ambrosius, uh, attached to Merlin. Now on the right uh, is a list of people named Arthur. Uh, this list was compiled by Mike Ashley in his book, uh, Brief History of King Arthur, and he goes, uh, describes each of them in detail, you know, the pros and cons, how, they, how closely they fit to the Arthur requirements and, uh, and that sort of thing, when they lived, what they did. Uh, and the first one is a familiar name if you've seen the 2004 King Arthur movie with Clive Owen. Uh, that is Lucius Artorius Castus. However, you'll notice the date there doesn't quite line up with the Battle of Baden. Uh, he's uh, alive around 140 to around 197. And he did uh, go to Britain for a short time, although uh, he began and ended his life uh, elsewhere in Europe, uh, pretty far away. He did have ties to the Scythians on the uh, uh, northern coast of the Black Sea. But that's where the sort of 2004 movie uh, historical connections end. Uh, and, and that movie is based on a book which went to greater lengths to try to make these connections, but those connections are just too speculative. So a Roman named Art something, something like Arthur, uh, who had uh, local uh, possibly local Britons uh, unified underneath him. Maybe uh, that happened, but it uh, doesn't quite line up historically. Uh, there are several other authors or people with a name like Arthur, uh, particularly Artuir. Each of these is tied to one or a series of battles. Uh, many of them could be, have potentially been low level chieftains, although none of them would have been a high king, a king who had other powerful nobles and potentially other kings uh, as subordinate to them, the way uh, Arthur is later remembered. Uh, the last two might actually be the same person, uh, and there's a, a scholar and historian named uh, Jeffrey Ash who has made the case that Riothamus was probably the, uh, the closest uh, to a, an actual Arthur figure, although he's uh, campaigning, he's leading his military campaigns in uh, Gaul, in uh, you know, the continental Europe, rather than on the island of Britain. But another thing these names indicate is that the name existed. It wasn't just Lucius Artorius Castus. He wasn't the only person with an Artor type name. And the reason for that is in Brythonic languages, uh, Celtic languages, uh, pre-Roman, pre-Latin languages, uh, the word Arth meant bear. And here we have a clue that we might have yet another bear's son, another uh, reference to the bear as the sort of apex predator for the Northern uh, Europe, Northern countries, uh, associated with a powerful individual 
and uh, while arth by itself isn't quite enough, the diminutive forms, so like the son of the bear or the grandson of the bear, would be artan or artuir or artur. Uh, not only bears, but there are bear gods like arteos, which means uh, bear-like. So all of these are names that could have very easily been given to someone who was remembered in oral poetry enough to uh, carry that story on and may have been so famous that the uh, that Aniran or whoever wrote the Gadothan uh, didn't have to say what this person did. Everyone who would have known who Artuir was. But we just don't know. This is, uh, again, very speculative. Uh, we have more possibilities. And unfortunately, in a situation like this, more possibilities actually leads to more confusion. Uh, this is the situation we've been in ever since the Epic of Gilgamesh, where the more fragments we find, uh, actually the more loose ends we have. We don't get closer to anything like a complete, solid picture. There's no Ur text. And if we did find a historical figure here, notice we've lost all of our boxes. Uh, this Artuir is not the King of Britain. Uh, he's at best a battlefield leader. There's no Sword in the Stone, no Lady of the Lake, no Excalibur, no Merlin, no Round Table, Guinevere, Knights uh, that we know by name, no Grail, and what to make of the Isle of Avalon, we don't know. Uh, I, I will talk more about the Island of Avalon in a later lecture. So we're left with kind of a ghost, and that's one of the reasons that I actually like a statue that a lot of uh, Arthur historians and uh, scholars uh, really hate. Uh, just a couple of years ago, in 2016, this statue was added to Tintagel, a former uh, fortification that uh, juts out into the ocean. Uh, it's in Cornwall in southern, uh, southwestern Britain. It is the location of Arthur's birth, according to uh, many early sources. Uh, this is the castle that Uther Pendragon had to get into in order to sleep with the grain, uh, the wife of the Duke of Tintagel. Uh, this is why Merlin had to change his appearance so that he looked like the Duke of Tintagel. Well, uh, this is an actual uh, uh, Iron Age fortification. It's a really good, strategically a good site, easy to defend. During the 1100s, it was refortified. You can still see those ruins if you uh, go there today. But back in 2016, this statue was uh, added. And when it was added there, a lot of people complained that Tintagel, that sort of rough, rocky, uh, features and the, the remains of this Norman castle was a ruin and it had some authenticity that way. And when they add this statue and they added a face of Merlin, they carved into a rock in another place, um, these sort of things the, pe led people to compare it to Disneyland. They're saying they're Disneyfying uh, the, the, this archaeological site. And there may be some truth to that. But I like the way this statue was designed. It was uh, sculpted, uh, the, the sculptor was named Ruben Einan. And the way he did it, he didn't just put a, a really impressive statue of a king. He has this, uh, you know, emptiness. You can see through him. He's sort of a ghost. He's a statue, but he's a ghost as well. When we look at him, we're also looking through him. And I think a lot of the fears about the Disneyfication of uh, these types of sites is, uh, has some legitimacy to it. But this is not a new complaint. In the year 1125, before Geoffrey of Monmouth publishes uh, the history of the kings of Britain, uh, William of Malmesbury, someone who did describe Arthur and Sir Gawain, he, although he described them briefly in his history, uh, he says, when he describes Arthur, uh, giving just a few facts, he says, this is the same Arthur of whom the Britons, even today, spout such nonsense. So what this tells us is, whatever's being said, we don't know how much of Arthur's myth has been developed before Geoffrey of Monmouth, but we know that however much it is, it's enough to annoy William of Malmesbury. Uh, he sees it as too uh, silly, too much nonsense, uh, uh, attached to what he sees as uh, something serious. So this leaves us with something of a choice. Do we agree with William of Malmesbury that whatever the earlier tradition is, uh, keeping it simple, uh, that's gonna be the extent of the story of Arthur. Uh, and if that's the case, we might have a Camelot that is not the impressive stone castles we see in the movies, but uh, a hill fort made of wood and built up on earthworks. Is that still Camelot? Uh, what if Arthur didn't pull a sword from a stone? What if he didn't have a round table? Uh, what if he didn't go on a quest for the Holy Grail? Uh, what if he wasn't even a king? And what if his name wasn't even Arthur? How much of the Arthurian legend can we take away uh, 
Once we see that so many of these familiar elements of Arthurian legend come from specific texts written at specific times in specific cultures, do we then say that this is no longer part of the, the real legend, the real story? Or can we say that there's sort of a, a center of gravity uh, between the writings of Geoffrey of Monmouth and Sir Thomas Mallory where uh, the things like the Round Table and the Holy Grail and uh, Lancelot and Guinevere, uh, courtly love and chivalry, when these things are added to uh, a story that was already centuries old, but yet give us something that really defines this story for us. Well, you and I don't have to make that decision, but every time a, a new narrator, a new author, wants to create a new piece of this uh, larger story, uh, anytime someone wants to create a new narrative, they have to decide which of these threads from this larger fabric do I use to interweave into my particular narrative? Uh, and what do I add to this? Uh, and what parts of my culture do I wanna add to this 1500 year old process of story formation? Every narrative that makes its way into the Arthur story is both a continuation of a previous uh, story formation process and also a piece of a specific place in time that says something from a particular cultural point of view. Whether it's uh, Chrétien de Troyes adding the story of the Grail in Percival, or it's Robert de Boron making that Grail into the Holy Grail, or it's Terry Jones making the quest for the Holy Grail a, a lampoon. So the text that we're gonna read for this unit are going to have to make that same sort of decision. Notice when you read it, not just what the plot is, but how that specific narrative attaches itself to this larger world. And even if King Arthur is a background figure, uh, even if the whole court and all the uh, familiar elements are, are just background, uh, the sort of backstory for this particular narrative, is this particular narrative something that could have been set elsewhere? Or is it something that needs this story world in order to do what it does? And even if you forget everything I just said in the last three lectures and everything you read in this class about King Arthur, about anything else, uh, it's very important to learn that this is how narratives work. When we try to follow a thread back to its source, we don't find one source. We find this constant activity going on. And the sort of amorphous protean uh, literature of King Arthur is an excellent example of this.